but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear. Hello, I'm Pastor Gervais Charmley. Welcome back to Bethel Evangelical Free Church Hanley on YouTube. In this video, I'm continuing to look at these historic works of theology, the first hundred years of the Cunningham Lectures, New College, Edinburgh. And in this video, I'm going to be looking at the finality of Jesus of Faith, an apologetic essay. This is the 1928 Cunningham Lectures volume by Alexander Martin, D.D., LLD, Principal of New College, Edinburgh. Well, who was Alexander Martin? Alexander Martin isn't well known today. His father is much more well known in evangelical circles, for he was Hugh Martin. Christ for Us, Sermons of Hugh Martin, published Banner of Truth, 1998, and The Shadow of Calvary. He's also noted for his book on the Atonement and a number of other works. And Hugh Martin is very, very much worth reading. He was one of the first generation of Free Church of Scotland ministers after the disruption of 1843. He came from Aberdeen originally. After the disruption, he was minister of Panbride Free Church. But in 1858, he went to Edinburgh to become Minister of Free Greyfriars. Alexander was named for Hugh Martin's father. And Alexander was born in Panbride in 1857. He studied, or went to his uh, secondary school, high school, at George Watson's College, Edinburgh. Went up to Edinburgh University and then on to New College to study for the ministry. Alexander Martin, of course, grew up hearing his father's preaching, grew up with his father. His father suffered from ill health and had to basically take early retirement before basically settling down for relatively quiet life, writing primarily. And he's left a lot of, a lot of books and a lot of articles which have been reprinted. He's, of course, very well known for his commentary on Jonah. And so Alexander's brought up, he's the son of this well-known leading man in the Free Church. And he himself is quite a, a dynamic personality, you might say. He was ordained in 1884 to the Free Church of Scotland, Morningside, Edinburgh. And in 1887 he married the daughter of the man who was his... Uh, senior pastor at Morningside. So obviously they got on fairly well. In 1897 Alexander Martin was called to be the Professor of Apologetics and Pastoral Theology at New College where he remained until his retirement in 1935. In 1918 he became the principal of the college. And, of course, by this point it is the United Free Church College. And in 1929 he was one of the leading men moving the United Free Church into union with the Church of Scotland. His father then was one of the first men, was one of the men he came out in 1843. And the son, in 1929, is one of the men who brings about the union of the majority of what had been the Free Church of 1843 and the Church of Scotland. It's not that the Church of Scotland has become more conservative, it is that the Free Church, which always included people who were more liberal, remember the Free Church split isn't over theology as such, it's over church politics. But it became increasingly liberal. And Hugh Martin's son, Alexander, is one of the men who moves it back. And puts an end, really, to much of the disruption split. Alexander, as I say, retired in 1935, and he died on the 14th of June, 1946. Now, he was Professor of Apologetics 
and pastoral theology. What is apologetics? The word means the defence of the faith. The Greek word is used in that passage I read from First Peter. And it's not to be confused with evangelism. Apologetics is not evangelism. Apologetics is the defence of the faith. Now, there was a whole group of early church fathers who are called the apologists, because what they did was they wrote reasoned defences of the Christian faith that were addressed very often to the emperor. One of the best known of the early apologists is Justin Martyr, who is called Justin Martyr, not that it was his surname, and contrary to the index of a certain book published by um, Broadman and Holman, but he was called Justin Martyr because he was a martyr, he was martyred for the faith. The point of an apologetic wasn't so much to argue people into Christianity, you can't do that, but to point out that Christianity is not irrational twaddle and nonsense, but also to defend Christianity against false accusations. If we think about it, one of the accusations that was brought was, for example, that Christians were undermining the state. So, in any totalitarian system, think modern-day China, there is this accusation Christianity is undermining the state, and the apologist's job there is to say, no, we're not, and here's why. So apologetics, the defence, the reasoned defence of the Christian faith. And there have been various schools of apologetics. You have, for example, the evidentialist school, so-called, which is arguing from evidences that, for example, design in nature, the irreducible complexity of the human eye, that all of these indicate the necessity of a creator. You have uh, the cosmological argument, for example, or the various, or you, again you can have an apologetic argument for the, the historical reliability of scripture, which is to say, look, the Bible in the book of Acts speaks of the Mediterranean world and wherever wherever Luke references the political leaders of any city or region, he uses the historically correct title. This therefore indicates the historical reliability of the Book of Acts, and that therefore means that we can accept the Book of Acts as history, and therefore the arguments of Acts, the argument of Luke's Gospel, is true. So that's a those are examples of apologetics. You have the presuppositional approach to apologetics that says, well, apolog in apologetics, everyone has a bias. I mean, that's a very important point to remember, that every human being has a bias. That's why unbiased reporting doesn't happen. Now, therefore, the idea that we, we say, well, there are some things that are neutral, that there's such a thing as neutral ground that we can meet the unbeliever on is nonsense. There's common ground, the common ground that we're created beings, but it's not neutral. And so you have these various schools of apologetics. Now, in the early 20th century, there is a particular type of apologetic that is represented, for example, by Patrick Carnegie Simpson's book, The Fact of Christ, that's represented to some extent by... C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity, when C.S. Lewis does apologetics, it's that kind of apologetic. And the finality of Jesus for faith is that kind of apologetic. It's not evidentialism, it's not presuppositionalism, but rather it is something else. So he begins in the epilogue to his work on the idea of progress, the late Professor Berry comments on the illusion of finality, which clings to the human mind. Our faculty of apprehension, he finds innately prepossessed in favour of what is at present within its grasp. The insight into reality already reached is apt to present itself as an ultimate attainment. The convictions that gather, which gather round it are not surrendered easily, and we become in consequence the ready victims of a species of self-deception. 
taking that which at the best is relative for final truth, reflecting the very nature of things and proof against change. So he begins with the problem, the Christian faith and historical relativity. That is to say that our historical knowledge, our knowledge of history, this is the, the historical apologetic, that our knowledge of history is always relative. We can never arrive at absolute knowledge of history. Not that I think anybody, certainly that any Christian, has ever thought we could. And so he then looks at the Jesus of history, Jesus the rabbi. Can we say Jesus is just a good teacher? No, we can't. Can we say he is a good teacher? Definitely. Jesus, the Messiah's son, the claims that Jesus makes for himself. The sinless Jesus is this man without sin. The answer is yes. Jesus, the saviour, he is presented as saviour. What does it mean for him to be saviour? And finally, Jesus, the judge. And so he argues from the, the history, using a method that is quite still quite popular among apologists, which is basically to say, well, look, the Gospels are basically historical, reliable documents. They are historical documents. And you really have to be some sort of serious sceptic to say the Gospels are not historical documents at all. And so what this species of apologetics does, it says, well, the Gospels are reliable historical documents. Therefore, what can we get from them as reliable historical documents? And can we then work from there towards faith in Christ as more than a historical figure? In approaching this question, Martin writes, it may not be irrelevant to recall the debt which history and the belief in ordered sequence, which is presupposed in history, owes to Christianity and its worldview. This I think true to say that only within the world of Christian ideas has what may be termed an historical or evolutionary view of existence as a whole be entertained by the human mind. As Spengler has it, we men of the Western culture with our historical sense are the exception, not the rule. Outside of Christendom today, such a thing as world history proper is, I believe, unknown, while in the pre-Christian time its place is taken by the anacyclosis or circuitous idea of a whole of things revolving on its own axis, so to say in an endless series of cycles of unprogressive change. It's interesting just in passing to point out the 2012 panic about the Mayan calendar, all of which is based on taking a, well first of all it's based on the idea that the Mayan calendar is has some kind of insight into the very nature of the universe, which seems to me a bit, a, bit, a bit of a stretch, to put it mildly, but also to forget. It also is to take this Mayan idea of this calendar and to think that when the calendar ends, that's the end. Well, no, actually, the Mayans did have this kind of cyclical idea, so the idea is when you come to the end of the calendar, you simply turn it over again and go round all over again. But to return to Martin, the concept, which is found everywhere from Aristotle to the later Stoics, illustrates characteristically the radical defect of Greek thought. Essentially dualistic, it never succeeded in arising to a properly teleological view of reality, that is in reality having an end in sight. Change accordingly being undeniable, an advance in some sort manifest, Mundane existence tended to be conceived of as an episode repeating itself aimlessly. <coughs> he goes on. Historically now, it is the Christian religion that has delivered the human mind from the oppression of so gloomy an outlook. Its underlying thoughts of creation, providence and the divine nature of man necessitate a totally different attitude. Together they have given birth instead to the sublime conception of the world as a developmental scheme. Now at this point, of course, you have his, his liberalism comes in. But his point is very simple, that the idea of history as a continuum with a beginning and an end is Christian. So that if, and of course, taking my position as a Calvinist, I would say, and therefore 
the idea of history itself is a Christian idea, certainly the way we understand history. Christianity has some, has a view of history that is different, because it has an end, there's a point to history. He goes on to speak of Jesus the rabbi, Jesus the teacher. And his summary is, is this, to sum up, the position we appear to be led to is that the ethico-religious teachings of Jesus, precious heritage though they be, are not after all his most characteristic contribution to the spiritual life of man, nor are they the most arresting portion of the records in which his history has come down to us. By themselves they are a torso, a fragment torn away from their context and robbed of much of their value in the process. So the idea that you can say, well, Jesus is just a teacher, and we take his teaching, and we leave out everything else, doesn't work. You lose Jesus there, because he presents himself in his teaching as God with us, Emmanuel. He presents himself as the Saviour, the Son of Man, who is come, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many for the forgiveness of sins that he comes and he can say your sins are forgiven you he is the messiah and he sees himself as the fulfillment of that and he sees himself as the son of god and the son of man that apocalyptic figure from the book of daniel that he is presented to us as sinless this man is without sin there is in jesus this lack of a sin consciousness, not because he's a superficial man. I mean, one thinks of the, the saying of Henry Ford, who said, I don't care who looks at my heart, and Alexander White, the Scottish pastor theologian, replies in one of his books, he says, well, that just demonstrates that uh, Henry Ford has never thought about his, has never looked into his own heart. But Jesus is presented as sinless in the true sense. And as the saviour, now again, one of the, the flaws by this period of really the, the theology represented by the Cunningham Lectures is that a robust doctrine of the atonement, such as that taught by Hugh Martin in his wonderful book on the atonement, has disappeared. That it is very much that Christ did something or other, that somehow or other, that Christ on the cross did something or other, that somehow or other led to some sort of of uh, benefit or other to the human race, to paraphrase Rabbi Duncan's criticism of uh, Robertson of Brighton. That he's a saviour, but how does he save? How does the cross save? And finally he is presented as Jesus the judge. The second coming is real and true. Christ is coming. There is a last judgment to come. But again, there is a certain illogic to the liberal here. But nevertheless, Christ is coming. Christ is coming. Apologetics is something we can't avoid. Because whenever someone brings up a challenge, then one element of answering it is to say, no, it's wrong, and here's why. But apologetics is not preaching the gospel. At the very most, it is clearing ground. Apologetics is really most useful for the, the Christian, confronted, for example, by the claims of Islam. How does the Christian answer the claims of Islam? Well, whatever answers you have end up in the realm of apologetic. But the historical apologetic is a useful one. The, the flaw of Martin and much of the historical apologetic is that it comes from the basis of saying, well, let us begin just by saying, well, the Gospels are more or less reliable historical documents. We don't begin, or they don't begin, with the inerrancy of Scripture. Many refuse even to end with the inerrancy of scripture. We have today, in the name of apologetics, 
as was the case in Martin's day, as was the case back in the period of when many of these lectures were delivered, people who, for the sake of apologetics, people, well, A.B. Bruce was one of them. James Denny is influenced by that. And this idea that we give up the outer works of the Christian faith to try to get a, a verdict for Christ from the standpoint of unbelief. No, we do not want to go to the standpoint of unbelief. We do not give up anything, but we proclaim Christ and him crucified. And yes, we are ready. We should be ready to give an answer, a reason. Why is it, a Muslim asked me once, that you say that Jesus is God? And I replied, because everything he said and, uh, and did leads me to see God in him. How do you know that? From the Gospels, from the Bible. And of course there the, the Muslim then launches at the Bible. It's all been changed wholesale, he says. What, how do you answer? Well, when you answer, how you, if you answer, and the answer is going to be, no, it hasn't been, because <laughs> no, it hasn't been. That answer, however brief, is apologetics, but it is not preaching the gospel. The gospel is this. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. The gospel is that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, and that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Well, thank you for watching, and may God bless you and keep you. And may he indeed help us give an answer for the hope that is within us. For Christ's sake. Amen.